Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to another event organised by the Scottish Polish Cultural Association. Uh, my name is Keith Mullins McIntyre. I am a vice chair of the SPCA here in Edinburgh. Um, the SPCA, as the name suggests, is a cultural organisation who, in normal times, organise events connected with uh, music, theatre, literature, the arts, dancing, uh, and a variety of uh, other sorts of events. But over the last few months, uh, we've also been arranging uh, online talks on different topics, and this is just the, the latest in a series that's been uh, running over the last half a year or so. Um, I, a special welcome also to members of the SPCA who are joining us tonight. Um, if you're interested in uh, the work of the SPCA or even potentially becoming a member, it only costs 10 quid, um, have a look at our website, which you can currently see the address for on the bottom left, scottpoles.co.uk, and more um, information about the organisation and its events can also be found uh, on Facebook at facebook.com uh, forward slash scottpoles. So tonight's event uh, will follow the normal format for those of us who have uh, joined us for them uh, previously. It lasts slightly under an hour, probably about 45 minutes or so. Uh, followed by a questions and answers session. Um, as already mentioned, I would recommend uh, could you please stay muted for the duration of the main talk. Um, the Q&A we will run using the chat function, again found uh, towards the bottom of the screen. Uh, to take part, you can either uh, write questions in the chat and uh, I will ask our speakers then during the Q&A, or if you wish, you can ask them yourselves. Um, just write something like, I would like to ask a question, please, in the chat, and we'll add you to the, the queue of questions. We just ask you, if you want to ask a question yourself, um, that's completely fine. We just ask you to keep them fairly concise, so that if there are quite a few, uh, we can get through all of them reasonably quickly. So without further ado, I'll hand us over to our speaker for tonight, an editor and journalist, at the um, Polish language newspaper based in London, to London, Tydzień Polski. It's my great pleasure to introduce Magdalena Grzynkowska. Good evening, everyone. My name is Magdalena Grzynkowska, and uh, I am the editor of Polish Weekly, Tydzień Polski, uh, the oldest uh, Polish newspaper in Great Britain. Um, Tydzień Polski was established in 1959 as a weekend supplement to Polish Daily and Soldiers Daily, uh, czyli uh, Dziennik Polski i Dziennik Żołnierza. Uh, it was created shortly after Polish government in exile got to London in 1940. And the aim of this daily newspaper run by the government uh, was to deliver um, information about situation in the front line, uh, as well uh, as in uh, occupied Poland, uh, to Polish soldiers uh, placed in many different parts of Great Britain. Uh, please note that not many of them spoke English at that time. So for them, it was uh, the only source of, of information. Um, <clears throat> After the war, when majority of them couldn't come back to Poland, uh, which was uh, uh, under strong Soviet influence, uh, the general uh, Anders, who was uh, Polish, but not only Polish, uh, war hero, uh, created Polish Cultural Foundation. Uh, and the aim of this charity was to organize cultural life of Polish community in London to organize events, concerts, and exhibitions, but most importantly, to publish Polish books and of course, Polish daily. For 75 years, um, every single day from Monday to Friday, Polish daily was issued and delivered to our devoted readers. And uh, for many of Polish uh, veterans, uh, veterans uh, stayed uh, the only link to their homeland. In 2015, due to changes in um, the publishing market globally, and of course, development of in internet, uh, Polish cult Cultural Foundation heavily hearted uh, decided to discontinue daily newspaper and make Polish weekly separate and independent magazine. And since then, Polish weekly, Tydzień Polski, it is issued every Friday. Uh, and, um, but besides this, 
publishing um, uh, area of our activity. Um, uh, Polish uh, Cultural Foundation has been engaged in uh, several cultural projects and all are aimed at preserving and promoting rich history and heritage of Polish diaspora in the United Kingdom. Um, so far, um, around uh, 500 books uh, were published in, in, in the best days uh, of, the, of the foundation concerts and, um, and exhibition, exhibitions were organized every month. Uh, even last year, during difficult time of pandemic, we managed to organize two exhibitions uh, commemorating Battle of Britain and Polish Union Solidarity Solidarność. Uh, one of the projects uh, co-founded with uh, a Society of Educational Projects uh, was a series of uh, books and documentaries about Polish artists uh, in the UK uh, called Anders Artists. And now I would like to show you excerpts uh, of one of them. So I will share my screen now. Widzisz te gruzy na szczycie, tam wróg twój się kryje jak szczur. Musicie, musicie, musicie za kark wziąć i strącić go z chmur. I poszli szaleni za żarci, i poszli zabijać i mścić. I poszli jak zawsze uparci, jak zawsze za honor się bić. Czerwony maki na Monte Cassino, zamiast rosy piły polską krew. Po tych makach szedł żołnierz i ginął, lecz od śmierci silniejszy był gniew. Przejdą lata i wieki przeminą, pozostaną ślady dawnych dni. I wszystkie maki na Monte Cassino czerwiejsze będą, bo z polskiej wzrosły krwi. Czerwone maki na Monte Cassino zna chyba każdy. Ta pieśń naprawdę powstała podczas bitwy i została po raz pierwszy wykonana, gdy tylko opadł dym nad zdobytym klasztorem. Autorem tekstu Czerwonych Maków jest Felix Konarski, znany również pod pseudonimem Refren, jeden z najlepszych twórców piosenek międzywojennej Polski. Refren napisał Czerwone Maki w nocy z 17 na 18 maja 1944 roku, czyli na dobę przed zakończeniem bitwy pod Monte Cassino. Pracował w wojskowym namiocie. Ledwie skończył dwie pierwsze zwrotki, obudził Alfreda Szuca, uznanego kompozytora, który zachwycony tekstem błyskawicznie napisał do niego słynną melodię. W dniu zakończenia bitwy pieśń miała już premierę. Wykonał ją Gwidon Borucki, gwiazdor teatrów przedwojennego Lwowa, wraz z doborową 14-osobową orkiestrą Szuca. Skąd wziął się tak doborowy zespół artystyczny tuż pod stokami Monte Cassino? Jakim cudem wraz z armią Andersa jej szlakiem bojowym szli najlepsi artyści polskich scen? 
Dodajmy jeszcze, że było ich wielokrotnie więcej niż tych zaangażowanych w powstanie i pierwsze wykonanie czerwonych maków. A czerwone maki, oprócz Gwidona Borockiego, wykonywały jeszcze inne gwiazdy piosenki związane z drugim korpusem polskim, w tym i przyszła żona generała Andersa, Irena, na scenie znana jako Renata Bogdańska. Z czasów wojennych widzimy różne gwiazdy, które nawet Marlena Dietrich śpiewała dla żołnierzy, Vera Lynn, ojciec po prostu zdawał sobie sprawę, że wojsko to potrzebuje. I to była polska parada. I oni jeździli z, z wojskiem i były przedstawienia. No i oczywiście tak się zaczęła miłość mojego ojca do mojej mamy, bo ojciec siedział w pierwszej rzędzie, a mama śpiewała. Irena, piosenkarka i aktorka występująca pod pseudonimem Renata Bogdańska i generał Władysław Anders, dowódca drugiego Korpusu Polskiego. To była wielka wojenna miłość, która wypełniła ich całe przyszłe życie. Nie obeszło się bez skandali i towarzyskich kontrowersji. Oboje mieli już małżonków, a na ich własny ślub przyszedł czas dopiero w 1948 roku. Ten związek opowiada nam jednak więcej niż piękną historię wojennej miłości. Chyba nic lepiej nie pokazuje niezwykłej natury dowódcy drugiego korpusu. Generał Anders był potężnej budowy mężczyzną, urodzonym kawalerzystą, żołnierzem i dowódcą. Ale uwielbiał teatr, rewie, scenę. Był przedstawicielem przedwojennej elity. Wieczór na teatralnej widowni był dla niego jak oddech. Po inwazji ZSRR na Polskę spędził długie miesiące w kazamatach NKWD. Kiedy losy wojny się odwróciły, a zaatakowani przez Niemców Sowieci musieli zabiegać o wsparcie aliantów, to właśnie Anders dostał niepowtarzalną szansę stanąć na czele polskiej armii. Od razu wykorzystał ją do tego, by poza wojskiem wyprowadzić z nieludzkiej ziemi jak największą liczbę cywili, inteligentów i artystów. Armia Andersa, czyli do 1942 roku Polskie Siły Zbrojne w ZSRR, a następnie II Korpus Polski, powstała po ataku Niemiec na Związek Sowiecki na mocy układu Sikorski-Majski. W jej skład weszli Polacy z ziem zajętych przez Sowietów, zesłani lub deportowani w głąb ZSRR, uwięzieni w łagrach i więzieniach NKWD. Po uformowaniu liczyła około 78 500 żołnierzy, którym towarzyszyło około 37 tysięcy cywilów. Byli wśród nich inteligenci, profesorowie i zupełnie prości ludzie, ale też co najmniej kilkuset artystów. W 1942 roku polską armię ewakuowano do Iranu. Oznaczało to ostateczne wyjście ze strefy wpływów Stalina. Dalszy jej szlak, z czasem już bojowy, wiódł przez Bliski Wschód, a od momentu lądowania aliantów we Włoszech właśnie przez Italię, w której wyzwalaniu polscy żołnierze odegrali bardzo ważną rolę. Symbolem ich poświęcenia do dziś pozostaje przede wszystkim bitwa pod Monte Cassino. A jedno z najpiękniejszych o niej wspomnień to właśnie Czerwone Maki, pieśń artystów żołnierzy Andersa. Jeszcze w 1942 roku generał Anders powołał do życia zespół Polska Parada, na którego czele stanął refren, czyli Felix Konarski. Do armii Andersa trafił też prawie cały lwowski zespół T-Jazz Henryka Warsa wybitnego kompozytora muzyki filmowej i jazzowej, przedwojennego dyrektora legendarnej wytwórni Syrena Records. Twórcę takich szlagierów jak Już taki jestem zimny drań, czy Miłość ci wszystko wybaczy. Artyści jechali do Buzułuku i innych ośrodków organizowania polskiej armii przez cały Związek Sowiecki. Mieli szczęście, że żyli i na ogół nie trafili do więzień czy lochów NKWD. Tuż po inwazji na Polskę Sowieci objęli represjami wszystkich Polaków, a szczególnie polskie elity. Nie mieli żadnych skrupułów, by wymordować prawie 20 tysięcy polskich oficerów i inteligentów w Katyniu. Paradoks polegał na tym, że akurat wobec muzyków, piosenkarzy i aktorów mieli nieco inne zamiary niż wrzucenie ich do dołu z wapnem. Chcieliby wciąż działały teatry i sale koncertowe. 
po to, by zachować pozory jakiejkolwiek normalności na objętych terrorem polskich ziemiach. Artyści mieli do tego posłużyć. Anders uratował ich przed tym losem i uniemożliwił Sowietom kontynuowanie tej polityki. My występowaliśmy dla tych, którzy przybywają z więzień i z łagrów. Co były trupy? Ludzie, szkielety w łamanach i mnóstwo dzieci z ogolonymi główkami, bo wszystkie po tyfusie. Ludzie na sali płakali. Stare chłopy siedziały na sali i oni płakali jak małe dzieci. Artyści z armii Andersa dostawali wojskowe przydziały i etaty. Chodzili w mundurach, choć oczywiście na scenie występowali również w kostiumach odpowiadających danemu programowi. Musieli meldować się na przepustki i pobierali posiłki z wojskowej kuchni. Mieszkali w obozach drugiego korpusu, wiedli zwykłe wojskowe życie z jednym zasadniczym wyjątkiem. Nie posyłano ich na front do walki z bronią w ręku. Tuż po zakończeniu wojny artyści z armii Andersa zrealizowali zupełnie niezwykły projekt. Nakręcili, pomyślany ze sporym rozmachem jak na trudne warunki 1945 i 1946 roku pełnometrażowy film fabularny Wielka Droga o losach żołnierzy drugiego korpusu. Osią fabuły jest pamiętnik rannego pod Monte Cassino żołnierza, który czytał ukradkiem pielęgniarka w wojskowym szpitalu. W ten sposób poznajemy całą historię tułaczki po Związku Sowieckim, formowania armii, a następnie jej szlaku przez Bliski Wschód do Włoch. Film wyreżyserował Michał Waszyński, muzykę skomponował Henryk Wars, a zagrali w nim m.in. Albin Ossowski, Jadwiga Andrzejewska i Renata Bogdańska. To właśnie z wielkiej drogi pochodzi słynna piosenka, gdzie najlepiej? W Lwowie. Po wojnie żołnierze generała Andersa złożyli broń i zdjęli mundury. Pochłonęły ich trudy i wyzwania emigracyjnego życia, ale nie połamali piór, instrumentów czy mikrofonów. Dalej tworzyli piosenki, układali repertuary rewi i kabaretów i przede wszystkim występowali na scenie. To dzięki nim na emigracji wciąż rozwijała się polska kultura. W Londynie kształtowała się niezwykła atmosfera małej Polski, w której emigracyjne elity starały się żyć w miarę możliwości dokładnie tak, jak w przedwojennej Warszawie. Nie było tam wprawdzie kawiarni ziemiańska ani Adri, ale byli Marian Hemar, Henryk Wars, Mieczysław Grydzewski. I byli tam polscy aktorzy, aktorki, piosenkarki i piosenkarze, wreszcie całe profesjonalne polskie zespoły muzyczne i artystyczne. Dlaczego za Andersem poszło tak wielu artystów? Chyba dlatego, że tak wielu z nich poszło na wojnę. I historia Polaków potraktowała wtedy okrutnie, wrzuciła większość z nich na Syberię. Stamtąd powrót, jeśli był, to był przez Buzłuk razem z armią Andersa. Kiedy korzystając z układu Sikorski-Majski, Polacy mogli stworzyć swoją armię, zrobili to i znowu poszli do niej wszyscy, którzy ocaleli. Byli wśród nich również artyści, artyści pióra, artyści pędzla, artyści filmu, wszystkich mus, Melpomene również. Miałem przyjemność znać osobiście pana prezydenta Ryszarda Kaczorowskiego. Pan prezydent powtarzał słowa do wolnej Polski kiedyś, być może wszyscy, być może niektórzy z nas, ale jednak wrócimy. Ja nie wiedziałem, że to są słowa Andersa, który chciał ocalić jak najwięcej z patriotyzmu. To ten patriotyzm z kolei kazał mu wiedzieć, że spośród grona wszystkich ocalałych trzeba wybrać tych, którzy będą tworzyć przyszłą Polskę. Nie będą jej robić tylko rękami, ale również swoimi umysłami, swoim talentem. Stworzenie nowej Polski, tej Polski, do której wszyscy chcieli wrócić, leżało w rękach wszystkich, również tych Andersa, ar artystów. W tych... okresie powojennej emigracji polscy artyści z armii Andersa nie ograniczali się do występowania wyłącznie dla mieszkających w Londynie Polaków. Zespoły Hemara czy Refrena odbywały turnę po Stanach Zjednoczonych czy Europie Zachodniej. 
Irena Anders także powróciła na scenę. Znów jako Renata Bogdańska występowała przed mikrofonem w brytyjskiej BBC, ale także w amerykańskich salach koncertowych czy w Izraelu. W tym ostatnim kraju była szczególnie kochana. Słynęła tam z jednego z najlepszych wykonań pieśni będącej nieformalnym hymnem Izraela. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, maybe this first part was a little bit depressing, uh, but I promise the rest of it will be more optimistic. Um, uh, but I thought this um, uh, introduction is important uh, to understand who um, Anders artists were, uh, because even for me, someone who studied uh, Polish history, it was quite um, uh, obvious uh, why there were, it, it, it wasn't quite obvious uh, why there were so many um, artists in a second Polish corp. Um, so one of them was uh, Gwidon Borutski mentioned in a, in, a, in, in a documentary we just saw. Um, he is also known as Guido Lorraine. Uh, he's an actor and singer and first husband of uh, Irena, aka uh, Renata Bogdańska later uh, generals under sweat. And uh, I will read now an excerpt of his memoirs that you can find in one of our books. So, um, so this is the, the, the second volume. Uh, it's Artisti Andersa, Scena i Estrada, Anders Artists on Stage. And uh, it focused on, um, on um, actors and singers uh, uh, from a, a Polish, a second Polish corp. And Gwidon Borudski uh, uh, um, said that uh, as uh, it, it is well known after 1933, uh, sorry, 39, a part of Poland was occupied by the Germans and the other by Soviets. Uh, my family lived in Przemysl, uh, where the river Sun formed a border between these two areas. And uh, so it found itself under the uh, Soviet occupation. Uh, I decided to leave Warsaw and overcoming some problems, uh, I reached Przemysl. After several weeks, I traveled from town to Lwów uh, to see whether um, there are any job opportunities for people of my profession. Um, so this is then one of the photographs you can find in, uh, in our book. Um, all of these people are uh, Polish artists in Lwów. Um, it turned out that many actors and musicians did exactly the same and escaped uh, the German part and traveled to Lwów or to Białystok. To our surprise, um, the Russians, contra in contrary uh, to Germans, uh, allowed uh, Polish artists uh, to perform. Um, after several performances in Lwów, uh, the management sent us uh, for a four months uh, of uh, uh, four-month tour uh, of Russia. We played in Kiev, uh, Moscow, Leningrad, and Odessa, uh, everywhere uh, to packed audiences, and always to for several weeks in each of these cities. Uh, the Russian audience received us uh, enthusiastic, enthusiastically. Those are the only bright moments in the grey, grim life after Stalin's regime which did not spare even its own citizens. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, that was the reality of uh, uh, Anders uh, artists uh, um, during, during Soviet occupation. They, they didn't, um, uh, they, they were, were, weren't then uh, art, Anders artists, they were Polish artists. But after uh, they, jo they joined, um, uh, second uh, Polish second core, uh, they become uh, under art artists. Um, so after 
uh, Polish forces uh, joined British soldiers in Iran. Polish parade, um, how uh, this uh, group of Polish artists were, were called, um, performed not only for, um, for Polish military units but, and Polish civilians evacuated from Russia, but also for British army and for local people. Uh, Felix Konarski, uh, refrain, uh, constantly wrote new songs. So he had a good practice before writing red poppies uh, on Monte Cassino, um, because it make, it, it, he made it in, in only one night during the victorious battle of uh, Monte Cassino. Um, the author of the lyrics recalled uh, these moments this way, and I will uh, read another excerpt. We returned, uh, we returned late at night, although it was, I was deadly tired. I could not sleep. I kept on coming onto the window all the time, watching flashings of the artillery uh, fire far away. Casino is there. During the day, you can sow poppies on the slopes. Now they are burnt with fire. So attack was started. So there is blood and death, but also victory. And uh, this is how I remembered the, the, this night uh, Bruno Schultz, who is uh, an, an author of the music to the, to the song. Uh, the message about the victory came to um, Monte Cassino in the evening hours. Weary with pressing thoughts and feelings, I fell, uh, I fell asleep uh, in my clothes with the lamp still on. Around 11 p.m., an extremely excited reference, Konarski, ran into my room. In his hand, he held five texts, which he gave me to read, asking to compose the, mu the music uh, for it immediately, so we, can, so we could perform the song on the next day, during the celebration at the feet of the mountains. Uh, I must admit, then I, when I read these deeply moving lyrics, and the shivers ran down my spine. I read it a second and third time, humming the melody in my mind. I sat at the piano, and without writing a single note, I sang the whole song to refrain, Czerwone Maki, as it is known today to millions of Poles in Poland and abroad. The second and the third verse we were already singing together. I remember refrain calling, Fredio, this is it. This is what I wanted. So this is the story of the of this uh, very moving um, a song that you could hear in the beginning of the documentary. Uh, after the, mobi the mobilization of the um, artists uh, uh, of the um, of the troops, um, artists uh, immediately joined. Uh, ZASP, uh, Association of Artists of uh, Polish uh, Stages. Uh, the Polish cultural life in London became quite vigorous. Um, stages like uh, the one in Ognisko uh, Polskie or in White Eagle were always fully booked. But not all uh, artists stayed in England. A few of them returned to Poland. Um, others like Felix Konarski, Lucena Szczepańska, and uh, Nina Oleńska emigrated to the uh, United States, to uh, Chicago. Uh, Henrik Bars, uh, a composer of uh, many songs, um, including uh, Tylko we Lwowie, only in Lviv, uh, where he, um, he emigrated to Los Angeles, where he wrote music for movies and TV series. Other people went to Canada, some of them went to South Africa, I'm not gonna uh, list all of them, but majority of artists stayed in England. And the, the temporary immigration progressed to be permanent. Outside, uh, the, of the, outside Poland, um, every actor organized their life the best they could. Um, in post-war era, um, Opportunities, opportunities for actors of foreign uh, origin were quite extensive. 
during 15 years of uh, living in England, for example, Gwydon Borutski played in 45 movies. Unfortunately, not all of the Polish actors were that, act uh, were that lucky, so uh, not many of them were working in their profession. This is why a lot of um, Polish associations and um, uh, organizations were established um, shortly after the war because they had the same goal to support Polish uh, community and their families in adapting to new life in the United Kingdom. Uh, starting with um, uh, education, uh, establishing Polish Saturday schools through cultural events in Polish uh, settlement camps and veteran centers, not to mention creating the network of Polish Catholic, Catholic parishes. Um, but the work stayed unrecognized for many years. Uh, Professor Victor, Jan Viktor Sienkiewicz, the, the, the author of the first volume of Anders Ar Ar Artist, unfortunately I don't have this, this, this volume with me, um, no, forgive me <laughs> that. Um, and Professor uh, Sienkiewicz underlines that uh, uh, we are facing a kind of revision of the history of 20th century Polish art because um, Polish art in common sense, uh, but also academ academically applies uh, only to fine arts and uh, um, arose with, um, within the um, post-war Polish borders after uh, 1945. So this is not exactly the history of Polish art, but the history of art in communist Poland. Um, General Anders understood the importance of the survival of uh, Polish identity, um, Polish history and uh, uh, tradition and culture. Uh, the communist regime uh, did everything to ensure that uh, his work, which was inspired by, by his patriotism, remained undiscovered. Uh, luckily, Polish London, Little Poland, contains has preserved this heritage uh, because uh, Polish diaspora in Great Britain had a strong group of talented painters, sculptors, um, graphic de designers, uh, architects, actors, directors, musicians, poets, and writers. But for, for instance, um, names such as um, Topolski, Żuławski, Potworowski, Knapp, uh, were not properly recognized in Poland until the great exhibition at the Zachenta Gallery in Warsaw in 1991. So there are a lot of blank spaces, and, but we are trying to uh, fill them uh, up in restoring the rightful place in the history of Poland. Um, the task has been carried out so successfully, I hope, uh, people who are, had survived sold their Polish identity. And to sum up uh, the, this part of uh, our evening, uh, I would like to read another excerpt from another volume of, of the books, uh, of the series of the books, uh, Anders Artists, Little Poland on the Thames. Uh, and it's a little bit different than previous uh, volumes because uh, the first one was about painters, the, the, the second one was about uh, artists uh, on stage. But this one is combining these two worlds um, and has three parts. One of them uh, is, you can see, one of them is uh, on stage, the other one, visual arts, and uh, this, the third one, daily life and celebration. So it's like a full spectrum of uh, life of Polish expats. And, uh, and the sentence I wanted to uh, read to you, it's uh, by Viktor Budzyński, Polish politician and also leader of Polish community in uh, pre-war uh, Lithuania, which was a part of Poland that, uh, at the time. Uh, there can be theater without fatherland. There can be a theater without subsidies, loans, or grants. There can be a theater without curtains or wooden tables. 
but surely there is no theater without people. So uh, this is uh, this is I think very nice summary of uh, of what uh, Anders artist did. Um, and uh, and as I said, um, uh, this this book has a lot of uh, reproductions uh, of the of the Polish art uh, as well of archive um, and photographs. So it, it's really um, it's. It's quite something. It's a, it's a good uh, thing to have uh, if you are interested in Polish history. Uh, and just before we open the floor to questions uh, from the audience, I would like to show another excerpt of the uh, from the documentary. Uh, so yeah, I will share the screen again. Powojenny Londyn stał się nowym domem dla tysięcy byłych żołnierzy armii generała Andersa. Wśród nich znalazły się setki wybitnych polskich artystów wszystkich dziedzin sztuki. W Londynie stworzyli barwny i bogaty, przez całe dekady w kraju niemal nieznany, polski emigracyjny świat artystyczny. Jesteśmy na południowym brzegu Tamizy w Londynie, tu na South Bank, w podmostowej arkadzie mostu, który widzimy za mną, mostu łączącego stację Waterloo i Charing Cross. Mamy pracownię Feliksa Topolskiego i pracownię drukarską Oficyny Poetów i Malarzy. Po sąsiedzku te dwie instytucje polskiego Londynu znalazły tu swoje miejsce daleko poza polskim centrum, jakim był Kensington w tamtych czasach. Jednym z pierwszych polskich twórców, którzy jeszcze przed wojną osiedli w Londynie, był Felix Topolski. Artysta, który w przejmujący sposób dokumentował II wojnę światową. Felix Topolski przyjechał do Anglii w roku 1935. Dostał zlecenie z wiadomości literackich, aby przedstawić rysunkowo reportażowy materiał z koronacji króla Jerzego. Będąc w Anglii, poznał całą artystyczną elitę tutejszego środowiska na czele z George'em Bernardem Shawem, który otworzył mu wszystkie drzwi z naciskiem wszystkie, bo faktycznie kto może pochwalić się freskami w Buckingham Palace. Przez portretowanie wybitnych postaci światowej polityki, świata artystycznego i kultury stał się wśród Polaków również nazwiskiem pierwszoplanowym i myślę takim został do ostatnich dni. Artystów, wojennych emigrantów wspierał też Marek Żuławski, malarz tworzący w Londynie od 1936 roku. Był dla nich przewodnikiem po londyńskim świecie artystycznym, a dla części także mentorem. Prowadził regularne pogadanki o sztuce w BBC, był też cenionym krytykiem i historykiem sztuki angielskiej. Marek nie był osobą, która uważała, że należy żyć w getcie, prawda? Przede wszystkim, jeśli w innym kraju, to trzeba również poznać kulturę, poznać język. Ja pamiętam, że jak ja przyjechałam na początku mojego pobytu w Anglii, to spotkałam panią, która w ogóle nie wiedziała, co się dzieje poza polskim środowiskiem, poza polskim kościołem. Ją to zupełnie nie obchodziło. Natomiast ważne jest, że, że jeżeli się mieszka w danym kraju, to dobrze wiedzieć, co się dzieje naokoło i jak ludzie żyją, jakie są wydarzenia kulturalne. To nie tylko chodzi o, o polski teatr, co jest bardzo ważne. Ja bardzo lubię chodzić do polskiego teatru, ale również lubię chodzić do angielskich teatrów. Emigracja oznaczała konieczność podjęcia pracy zarobkowej. Generał Sosabowski pracował jako magazynier. Fizycznie pracowali też dowódca AK, generał Bur Komorowski i komendant policji, generał Zamorski. Jeżeli chodzi o utrzymanie się z samego malarstwa, to wydaje mi się, że żaden artysta się nie mógł utrzymać. 
Kiedyś nie było stać ludzi na kupowanie obrazów. Marian Bochusz-Szyszko, wybitny, uznany jeszcze w przedwojennej Polsce malarz ekspresjonista, otworzył w Londynie słynną polską szkołę malarstwa. Wychował całe pokolenia emigracyjnych artystów. Przyczynił się też do tego, że w Londynie toczyło się niezależne polskie życie artystyczne. Aż do śmierci w 1995 roku pozostawał prezesem emigracyjnego Zrzeszenia Plastyków Polskich. Innej kandydatury nawet nie rozważano. Pierwszy polski teatr otwarto już w 1940 roku w Ognisku Polskim. Jak myślę o scenie polskiej, to na, na myśl przychodzi ognisko polskie. Ognisko było naszym domem. I po pracy wiadomo było, że idziemy do ogniska. To był klub, do, w którym żeśmy się wszyscy spotykali. I to było inne życie. Ta scena w ognisku była bardzo maleńka. Trzeba było uczyć się po niej chodzić, bo była taka mała. Natomiast z tej małej sceny wypływały wielkie rzeczy. I siedząc, patrząc się i słuchając, czułam taką wielką falę pięknego języka, który płynął na mnie i który wzbogacał moje, moje pojęcie o tym, co to znaczy być Polką i co to znaczy chcieć być Polką. Po premierze były zawsze jakieś spotkania i było przyjęcie u Ireny Delmar, pamiętam, i było całe towarzystwo. Kielanowski, który reżyserował, powiedział czy mo, do Mrożka, czy mógłby coś powiedzieć na ten temat. Mrożek wstał i powiedział, niewiele mam do powiedzenia, dlatego piszę. I usiadł. To było wszystko, co powiedział. Nie było w Londynie roku bez przynajmniej kilku polskich premier. Lwowiak Marian Hemar był sławny na długo przed wojną. Napisał ponad 3000 piosenek, wiele znanych do dziś. W czasie wojny służył w armii, potem przeniesiony do Londynu zajmował się walką z hitlerowską propagandą. Pisał programy kabaretowe i sztuki, a na antenie Radia Wolna Europa prowadził jednoosobową audycję Teatr Hemara z ostrą satyrą polityczną. Pierwszy raz Hemara to zobaczyłam w studium muzycznym, do którego chodziłam. Uczyłam się u jakiej profesorki Heleny Bakowskiej, uczyłam się y, śpiewu. I Hemar przychodził tam też do tego studia muzycznego w samym centrum Londynu na Hanover Street. I zwróciłam uwagę, że przyszedł bardzo piękny mężczyzna, ale trochę mu wzrostu brakowało. Marian chyba reangażował mnie i do Radia Wolnej Europy i dostałam właściwie pierwszą rolę jako piękna Lucynda, zaangażował mnie do operetki. Celem POSKU oryginalnie było Polsce i wolnym Polakom na pożytek i uważam, że to jest wciąż, wciąż aktualne. Dla mnie najważniejsze jest to, żeby w POSKU każdy sobie coś znalazł dla siebie. Od właśnie muzyki jazzowej, po operę, po teatr, kabaret. A również bardzo ważnym zadaniem naszym jest, żeby promować polską kulturę na zewnątrz. Dlatego nie jesteśmy zamknięci tylko na społeczność polską, ale zapraszamy tu jak tylko możemy yy, Brytyjczyków, żeby przychodzili tutaj yy, Prawda, zapoznawali się z kulturą polską. Plakaty zapowiadające przedstawienia, rewie i kabarety, katalogi wystaw, graficzny dwutygodnik Kronika Topolskiego, w której słynny rysownik dokumentował najważniejsze światowe wydarzenia, powieści, eseje, poezja. To wszystko ukazywało się w Londynie za sprawą niewielkiego wydawnictwa, które z czasem uzyskało status prawdziwej instytucji. W roku 1948-1949 powstała inicjatywa, aby stworzyć prywatne wydawnictwo, tak zwaną Small Press. Tego zadania podjęli się Czesław i Krystyna Bernarczykowie, którzy odkryli w sobie pasję drukarską, jeszcze mieszkając w domu pisarza na Finchley Road. Polscy artyści musieli zaczynać w Londynie życie niemal na nowo. 
a jednak w imponującym tempie stworzyli własny, tętniący życiem wielobarwny, artystyczny świat. Dla nich polski Londyn był kontynuacją utraconej II Rzeczypospolitej. Podczas gdy w Polsce królowała szarość i propagandowa sztampa, oni starali się żyć niczym w przedwojennej Warszawie czy Lwowie. To były kolorowe czasy tutaj także. Jak pan pomyśli o latach 60. To były, to były wszystkie te lata, które bitlesi. To wszystko były kolorowi ludzie. Kolorowi ludzie w ogóle mieli, mieli że tak powiem, wielką e, wtedy władzę tutaj bym powiedziała, jeśli chodzi o styl, o upodobania. I to się samo przenosiło na polskie środowisko także. To był inny styl ubrania, inny styl muzyki. Refren, co prawda, na, pamiętam, w takim programie wy, wystąpiłam, jak Beatlesi zaczęli śpiewać. Dał mi taką perukę z białymi prawie włosami, z taką krótką spódniczką, ledwo przykrywającą to, co ważne. I, i śpiewałam I love you, yeah, yeah, yeah. To się bardzo podobało w polskim środowisku. Nasi Okay, so uh, this is it. This is then uh, the final excerpt that uh, I wanted to show you. Um, I think these people spoke better about these times than me because they, um, uh, they experienced it. Uh, so, uh, and this is why I wanted to show you this, this part. Both of these uh, documentaries I show you today are part of the um, project and as ar artists and uh, could be uh, purchased uh, with the books. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid that uh, this one about uh, uh, artists oops, uh, on stages uh, is it, not available anymore, but uh, this, you can still uh, uh, buy this one if you are interested and uh, this documentary full uh, documentary it's available with it uh, on dvd so yeah so this is uh, all from me and um, i'm really curious if you have any questions for me so thank you very much for the the talk the presentation and the the documentary excerpt magda um because Professor Sienkiewicz was here in Edinburgh a couple of years ago promoting, I think, the first two books. But it's good to hear more about them and uh, the, from somebody else's perspective and also to see uh, extracts from the documentaries about them. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, any questions that you have for Magda, um, again, just use the, the chat function at the bottom of the screen, um, either to, to write the actual question or if you just say, I'd like to ask a question, we can uh, unmute you. And you can ask directly. Um, just to start off, um, what one question that I had was that uh, Lvov com comes up quite a lot. Um, of course, Lvov being in uh, Lviv in Western Ukraine now. Um, was that the kind of main artistic, cultural, theatrical and similar centre in interwar Poland? And do you know if there was a reason yeah. why that city rather than, than any other? Yeah, it was one of the centres of the culture in Poland of pre-war Poland. So there were, I think, three main uh, places where the culture were blooming. Uh, the one was Warsaw, the second was, was Krakow, Krakow, and the third one, Lviv. So, um, so obviously all of them, they had their own um, features, uh, but, uh, but yeah, all, the, all artists on of 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 all areas they could find jobs there and uh, there, there there were a lot of uh, theaters there and uh, universities uh, that um, people can uh, where where people could uh, study uh, singing music uh, performing arts 
so so yeah the, the, this is the, this is the three main cities in pre-war uh, Poland that uh, all the cultural life were, was going on. Can I say that Lviv was a very multi-ethnic city with people well, from various sorry sorry yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it. It was. I think um, most of the cities in Poland were multi <coughs> um, as well as uh, Warsaw uh, and uh, and Krakow. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think this is like a magic of uh, a magnetic magic of big cities. Like uh, people from all around the world are coming there, and uh, and part of them they stayed because uh, they were a pretty nice place to live. Mm. I have a, a little bit of a request and a little bit of a story that has a connection in Lvov, but mm -hmm. spills over into the connection between Poland and Scotland. Um, I don't know if I'd try to encapsulate this as quickly as I can. In Lvov, before the war, in the math department was a very famous mathematician, Stefan Banach, world famous would have won a Nobel Prize in Mass if there had been one. Banach liked to meet with his mathematical colleagues in cafes to discuss problems. And they ended before the war in a cafe called the Scottish Cafe, probably so named because of the design of the building. They would write the problems and the solutions on the marble tabletop in the cafe and they were wiped out at the end of the evening by the waiter, they were written in pencil. But eventually his wife gave him a notebook and they started to record the solutions. It was hidden when I think the Germans invaded. Eventually, after the war, this, this was called the Scottish Book and taken by one of his colleagues to America translated and published, and is very well known in mathematical circles. But going back to the cafe, I had, I've been doing quite a bit of research on this. The cafe was designed by a Polish architect, uh, Zbigniew Browicz Lewinsky, around about 1914. And during the First World War, and in the war with the Bolsheviks, he became a cavalry officer, worked his way up to Colonel, transferred to Warsaw. He had a flat in uh, Alea Shoka, infamous, if you know about the, the Nazis or the Gestapo headquarters in that street. Before the war, he became a special advisor to Pesudsky. Uh, when the Germans and Russians invaded, he escaped through Romania, etc., to France with his family and then to Glasgow. By this time, the colonel was about um, 60 odd, so he wasn't going to be a fighting man. And he was asked by the Polish army to care for the welfare of Polish families in Scotland. After the war, he and his wife bought a boarding house in Glasgow, but he became an artist or used his artistic skills and even sold paintings in Scotland. And he died in a road accident in 1953. Now, I've encapsulated that very quickly. I'm trying to write an article that connects, if you like, the mathematician and the Scottish book, the Scottish cafe, and the fact that the architect soldier ended up and ended his life in Scotland. It's just such a fascinating story. But I'm trying to find more information about particularly the Colonel. Mm -hmm. What was he uh, doing? Sorry, what was he doing? Uh, what were his duties, etc in the 1920s and the 30s, and what happened to his works of art, which apparently were very well received and sold in the early 50s. 
Sorry, you were going to say. I just wanted to address what you already said. Uh, I, I, I haven't heard of, of this story. I know that there is a lot of fascinating stories about Polish uh, um, people uh, in Scotland, in, in Great Britain. Uh, I actually forgot to mention during my lecture that there were also uh, artists uh, in Scotland. Uh, not that many, like in uh, England, uh, especially London, but there was um, uh, Józef Sienkowski, for example, who is a um, painter, print, who was a uh, painter, printer, illustrator, and also uh, he taught um, uh, art uh, in Glasgow School of Art, oh. and uh, also graphic design uh, in, in Dundee. So, uh, so he is quite uh, uh, well known, uh, and uh, also the other artist was uh, Stanislav Kajetan Szespolewski. Uh, he's not really um, uh, he's uh, not uh, often used as a Scottish artist because uh, he he lived in Scotland, then he moved to England and to Netherlands. So, but. Uh, when the brief time he was in Scotland, uh, he created a beautiful series of um, uh, uh, nativity scenes, like small small cards, very crafty, very, very beautiful, well designed. Uh -huh. um, and uh, one uh, one more to mention is uh, Albin Bratanek, uh, who created a, a beautiful copy of. Um, uh, Famous, um, um, uh, famous painting, piece of art. I would say it's not painting. Um, piece of art uh, called "Our Lady of Ostra, Ostra Brama, Matka Boska Częstochowska," and it is created uh, from metal work. Um, oh, from yeah, from uh, from uh, cans, from soldiers' yes. cans. From corned beef cans. Yeah, exactly. So it's really, really interesting. But do you know I where it you is? Can, uh, St Andrews. No, it's in Fol It's in near near St Andrews in Falkland, uh, the village of Falkland in Fife, in a church. Really? Okay. Part of the palace that was used by the Polish troops uh -huh. uh, for services, because you probably know a lot of Polish soldiers were based in Scotland during the war. Yeah. So I yeah. didn't know who the artist was that made it, but it's quite impressive. I have a postcard of it somewhere in yeah. my house. And I'm pretty sure there are many more, uh, yes. but, uh, you know, we, we could uh, have this lecture way longer. <laughs> well, if you have any information about uh, the one I'm investigating, Brovich Levinsky, that uh -huh. might be helpful. Uh, I will type my uh, uh, email address in a chat oh. box so you okay, can, copy I can write it to and you. approach me after the um, yes. after the, the lecture. And of course, everyone who would like to ask any further questions or um, mm, I don't know, find out more about our project or buy a book or whatever, and feel free to email uh, me. It disappeared too quickly from the second part. Oh, really? I can send you directly then. No worries. No, I meant your email address disappeared from the screen. It came up there. Yeah. If, okay. if you just I click on... Directly to you. Um, if anyone would like to check that email address or anything else that comes up in the chat, you just click the chat box on the bottom of your um, screen and everything that's been said so far should be All right, there. I see it. Okay. Uh, there is a question. So, right. Yep. Our next. Could I ask a question? Yeah, I was about to. Yes. Okay. Go I'm on. sorry. Um, I don't know why, but on my screen it seems to say chat is disabled, which is baffling me somewhat. So I had to raise my hand to make a point. I don't know if anybody else is suffering the same gremlin. Um. Um. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. It actually brought some tears to my eyes, you know, a couple of points. It's very, very moving. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me that um, when we were in the basement of Eleven Drummond Place, um, sorting out all the books that had accumulated over the decades, 
um, we came across quite a few examples of literature, poetry, and even some adaptations of, 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 of well-known dramas um, printed uh, not just not just in uh, Palestine and Jerusalem um, in the Middle East. There was quite a lot of printing, you know, taking place at that time in support of the Polish soldiers, but also in Italy. And we had one example of a dramatization, which was clearly somebody sat down in the type with a typewriter and just typed in the old fashioned way an adaptation of a drama to be reenacted in five scenes. And it's all under the auspices of the second Polish Corps. And we had quite a few examples of these, which we've actually conserved. Um, one of the little tasks that we'd like to do eventually when somebody has some time is perhaps just put this little bit of a collection together because it, it was quite poignant to come across some of these examples. Um, these had obviously been brought, you know, to Scotland at some point um, by former soldiers or um, those connected at the time. And just thinking of the effort that people went to, you know, to actually support the soldiers in their endeavors, you know, in this way, it's just quite remarkable, absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, um, what you've just presented is the tip of an iceberg because so many people were involved in so many difficult circumstances to do so much, you know, mm -hmm. to keep the morale going. So um, at some point during this year or next year, perhaps we'll be able to put some of this information together and perhaps we can pass it on to you at some point, you know. Some nice little examples. Yeah, 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 I totally ag agree. Uh, I just wanted to I'll make this presentation uh, accessible for anyone who uh, maybe haven't heard of uh, this topic earlier. So um, yeah, uh, so maybe maybe some parts of it uh, they are obvious for um, for part of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, um, a lot more uh, a lot of uh, names I didn't mention. And uh, probably the, the books you, you mentioned, and they were printed by Oficina Poetów or Pol Polish Cultural Foundation. You can, you can check and give, give me a, <laughs> a shout uh, if, uh, if any of this organization uh, were published this, uh, this books, because uh, unfortunately, I don't, I'm not sure how it works with, uh, with Oficina, but uh, for example, in our case, in the Polish Cultural Foundation in London, uh, we don't have like a full set of 500 books that they were published because um, there were so many. Uh, we didn't have like a proper uh, um, warehouse uh, to, 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 to keep them there. And uh, we changed it, uh, changed. Uh, we moved to the offices quite uh, often du uh, during last um, a few years. So part of them, they just disappeared. <laughs> so um, so if you if you have any like uh, uh, books uh, like old ones uh, from these times, um, and just. Uh, yeah, you have my email, so you can you can uh, uh, you can contact me, and uh, I will be very grateful for this information because uh, we are still collecting all uh, mm -hmm. like all set of five hundred books that we published. Uh, I mean, we uh, I mean uh, Polish Cultural Foundation, not me personally, because I'm uh, here on quite uh, for a short time. Uh, I think we have some questions in the chat box. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I may mention somebody <laughs> who just been mentioned from Leszek Wiesik from Warsaw, who is listening to your beautiful talk, Magdalenka. I'm so glad I suggest this <laughs> to our committee. I'm Isabella Brodzinska, the chairperson of Scottish Polish Culture Association. There was one artist, Leszek, I hope you hear me. His name was Zif. Alexander. Alexander Zif. He was a he was an artist in Edinburgh. I met him actually. I hope Leszek listen and say something about it. Uh, no? 
Yeah, of course, I can listen to you, Isabella. <laughs> Best greetings to all of you from Warsaw. Uh, unfortunately, Alexander Zuf uh, died before I came to Edinburgh and before he left yes. for Italy. Uh, but really, he was a very famous artist. I should also mention uh, the second generation guy, Jurek Puter, uh, who was in St. Andrews. And maybe you don't know that one of the paintings by Felix Topolsky is uh, presented, is hanging on the wall of the dining room of Lord Provost uh, of Glasgow. Really? Yes, really. Wow, sorry. Really, so, so, mm -hmm. so, so it's still there. I remember when I visited the Lord Provost in 1996 or 96, eh, it was 96, I think. Uh, he was very proud to show me the painting, uh, George Bernard Show by Felix Topolsky, hanging in the dining room of Lord Provost of Glasgow. So mm -hmm. there are many interesting stories. Also, Lvovska Fala, who started, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, giving uh, uh, performances to the Polish soldiers already in 1940 in Scotland, 40, 41. So it was even before, let's say, the Anders artists came to, to the United Kingdom. Ah, it's a long story, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You also uh, mentioned uh, the Lvovska Fala uh, uh, in one of our book, the, the, the third volume. Uh, but as you, as you said, uh, that uh, they, they weren't like proper artists, uh, Anders artists. They, they, they came earlier, earlier, so so it's just a brief mention of that of them. But yeah, it's included in our book. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, one quick question that we had from at least one member when advertising this event uh, was that: Where is it possible to buy any of the books if we don't have them? I know you said at least one of them is not available or out of print, but I think the third one you said was still available. Yeah, the third one is still available, and the best way is to um, write to me directly or to uh, uh, teaching Polsky office. Uh, uh, yeah, and someone will approach you and arrange the, the delivery. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, um, I'm not sure about the other uh, volumes uh, because uh, the, 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 we have limited the amount of these books, uh, but, but the third one, uh, uh, at least uh, a few copies we have. So this, uh, this one, I can sh uh, this information I, I can share about. The others, uh, like the, the one by Viktor Sienkiewicz and uh, the, the second one about Polish uh, stage artists. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think they are not available. Um, uh, Keith, I, can, I have all the books, I bought them. And in due course, I shall pass on to the library in the Polish club once it's open, reopened, but you can have a look. And honestly, and I recommend it to do subscribe Tygodnik Polski, Dziennik Polski. Tygodnik is wonderful. It's, I, I have this for since I ever come to Scotland. I read it and that is well over 60 years. And Magdalena is the representative of the Tygodnik Polski. Thank you, Mag Magdu. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. And it was a very interesting lecture. And like Christinka, my tear comes to eye, to, to my eyes when I saw Renata, because I have a lovely photo of her, of um, Bogdańska, with her, <laughs> myself in Polish Embassy, and also quite a few, those lovely faces I, I met when I traveled to London for so many occasions. You brought me so many happy memories. Thank you very, very much. And I'm so glad you are here with us in Scotland, in Edinburgh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Makes all the difference to have somebody like you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for all lovely comments in the, in the chat section uh, and uh, very moving. Uh, uh, mm, uh, memories of your uh, grandparents or your uh, father. So, uh, so thank you very much for, for, for these kind words.
Just wanted to say that, um, you know, when we're searching through all of the books and we find some of these treasures, when you sort of hold it in your hand, and you realize where it's come from and how it's traveled, and what it meant at the time. It's, it's really very poignant. You know, you actually have something physical to hold, which was really very important. It's like having a picture that you can look at or a book or a typewritten five scene play, you know, that's been typed on an old typewriter. It's really quite, quite moving actually, because um, uh, these scraps of paper, I mean, I like history, you know, and, I, and I'm quite sentimental and uh, I just find it really very moving, you know, and I'm just, these, these films that you, the episodes that you had in the film and you mentioned a film called The Great Road. Is yeah. is uh, I did I didn't know about that. Is that something that you can see? I mean, wh where does that? Uh, well, uh, good question. Uh, I'm not, probably there is no uh, like a copy left of, of this uh, of this movie. We have some footages, uh, like some um, uh, um, photographs uh, of, from from the. Vilkadrova, but um, but uh, as far as I know, uh, it is not available to to to, to see it. Uh, that the copy uh, was, was were lost. Uh, but maybe maybe I'm I'm wrong. I I, I would have to check it because uh, even when we uh, we tried to, uh, to, to 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 make this documentary, we couldn't find like a copy that we can use. That it was like um, um, more than one hour movie. It was amazing thing to do uh, in such a terrifying circumstances. They 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 didn't have um, mm -hmm. like a proper uh, stage or uh, or no, they didn't have much equipment even mm -hmm. to to film it, and they did it. Mm -hmm. But, you know that's amazing what Polish people can do <laughs> because even even uh, uh, our newspaper was established like in a, uh, July of 1940 where just after like uh, Polish came to uh, United Kingdom and they already created a newspaper and the editorial office and everything so it's it's fascinating how uh, they could organize, uh, things and uh, and make it. Ah, wielka droga, chyba. Ah, okay. Kiro just just uh, uh, corrected me that wielka uh, droga could be found on YouTube. Uh -huh. So so maybe maybe you can find it there. Okay. But uh, for those who uh, who don't know uh, this uh, this movie. I just wanted to show a few photographs that we, we 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 have in our book, but I can't find it right now. Um. Anyway, it's uh. So yeah, if it is on YouTube, you can you can easily find it and uh, you can see it, and I totally recommend it to you because it's Thank yeah you. fascinating story. Thank you. I shall try that. I'm not an expert on YouTube. <laughs> I need to have somebody to tell me exactly where to find something. Helps if you're not muted. Um, if there are any last questions, ladies and gentlemen, um, again, we can pop them down in the, the chat function at the bottom, or if that's not working, uh, just use the, the hand up function in reactions, which is also down at the bottom. Um, one quick last one from me. Um, did other Polish forces in exile, um, such as uh, Maciek's Armoured Division or uh, Sosabowski's Parachute Brigade, did uh, are there any well-known artists or creatives who, who came from their ranks that you know of, or is it principally, I, I'm guessing the Second Corps maybe just bigger than them? Well, the Second Corps uh, was different because there were a lot of civilians there, and. Uh, um, uh, so basically, uh, the, the 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 artists were civilians. Uh, of course, they were somehow um, they included uh, civilians in the army. They had even uh, you know 
uh, the ranks and uh, they, they had uh, uh, uniforms, uh, but, uh, but I don't think uh, it happens in any other uh, corp. So probably there are, uh, this is the reason that so many artists wear among uh, Anders, Ar uh, Anders Army, because uh, in others probably there were also artists, but uh, they, are, they were soldiers. So among soldiers, there were less artists than among civilians. So I think this is the reason. Uh, but pro uh, probably yes, I, I think one of the uh, one of the, um, uh, the the artists from Scotland I mentioned, uh, uh, Alvin Bratanek, uh, was was an Anders artist. He came uh, here before Anders. Uh, I think he came with um, uh, General Maciek. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm not sure about Józef Sankalski and the other uh, artists we uh, we were speaking about today. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there were artists uh, everywhere. But in in under the uh, army, uh, they were uh, the, there were a lot of them because uh, because of the huge percentage of civilians. Okay. Just, just to say that the um, the Polish parachute brigade was was originally with Anders in the Middle East, coming out of the Soviet Union, but um, they um, when they were right when they got through Palestine into Egypt, those who became the the basis of the parachute brigade um, peeled off, as it were, and came via South Africa to Scotland to train in Fife whereas the rest went across the Mediterranean to Italy and fought at Monte Cassino and stayed with Anders. Um, and so in the, in the Great Road, which is a journey across from Buzuluk and across the Caspian Sea and into through Persia and to Palestine, that's when the artists were with Anders and then they continued into Italy. They didn't then, they didn't then come by South Africa to train us to, with the parachute brigade. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the, a little explanation there. Um, but the soldiers themselves, I mean, my father played the trumpet. <laughs> but yeah. He didn't have a trumpet to play when he was a soldier, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, well, basically, uh, Polish uh, people at the time, well, I think in general, they are very talented people and creative ones. Uh, but, um, um, but yeah, but when we think about Poland, uh, pre-war Poland, it was full of um, very creative people. Um, and it, it was one of the, uh, it, Warsaw was called the Paris of the East, so uh, of the North, uh, so. Um, it, was more, it was more than that because a lot, of the, a lot of the soldiers came from small towns and villages and they all had their music and their dance and their traditions. And you know the little village bands and so forth. They all had a creativity about them, and so, for example, when they came to Scotland, they were so popular because they had within themselves the music, the dance, this, this joie de vivre, you know, and the way to express themselves. So each soldier themselves was an artist, you know, and they captivated the hearts of so many. Um, so it wasn't just the high elite who were artists; the ordinary soldiers, many of them, had lots of these sort of skills you know and could express them in a more traditional way so it's really very sort of um let's not forget that art is not just the elite it's it's everybody else yeah yeah of course i totally agree yeah it's like a, a mixture um do, 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 do. Uh, Leszek Wiecek uh, also points out that the Lwowska Fala group were with uh, General Maciek in Scotland in 1941. So certainly there are, are persons of great artistic talent within uh, Maciek and Sosabowski and no doubt other elements of the Polish forces in Scotland and elsewhere in the West. Um, but it's, it's fantastic to see all these uh, volumes of, of work, of books and documentaries that have been made about Anders artists. Um, so if, are there any, I'm just checking if there are any last minute questions from anybody, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I know artists in Edinburgh, Shishko Bogus, and I'm not very sure which, 
He belonged to the army general, Matagor Anders. And I tell you a funny story. My husband and I, we work in Dean Village. He used to live in Dean Village one Sunday afternoon. And I said, oh, Vitold, it smells of cabbage. Must be somebody Polish here. <laughs> Sour crowd boiling. And, uh, and this person behind the wall said, yes, yes, it is. And that was Szyszka Bogus. But I'm not, he, he really was a very good artist. And I saw his painting in Polish um, house of, um, of one of the Polish German at the time. And he was really good, um, really very good artist. Uh, but I, I'm not very sure, Szyszko Bogus, if somebody will in, investigate who, which he regime belonged to, General Maciek or Anders. Uh, I think he was Anders an artist because he, uh, he, his main uh, workshop was in London. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's just my assumption, I should, actually, I, I, I should check it. But Bokus Szyszko uh, was mainly based in London. Probably he, he traveled or... Yes. But then he stayed in Edinburgh. <laughs> At one, because uh, because I, I personally spoke to him just for a moment, you know, he introduced himself. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. And it was Mrs. Um, um, Gley, she was the chairman, Mariam Gley, uh, of the, at that time, of Dr. Gley, combatants. Uh, he was the chairman of the Polish combatants. And she has one of his paintings. And she was one of them who General Anders, thanks to General Anders, she, she left Siberia. And it was also on, on our program, um, Martin Stepek, his father, was thanks to General Anders. He survived Siberia and went through. So I know personally Jan Stepek and his sister Danusha. So Martin was living, but I don't know, disappeared and never asked question. What a pity, Martin Stepek. So there you are. It was a very, very interesting, a lot of history and a lot of future generations should learn from it. Thank you very, very much, Magda. And thank you, Keith, for always <laughs> help me out with this. Thank you. You are a very good vice chairperson, I must say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very and much. And thanks to Elizabeth Rieflik Sharp, our vice president, who I am here with her, <laughs> because my computer is not working very well at the moment. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Leszek, hello to Warsaw. Thank you. I'm in Krakow actually now. <laughs> oh, good heavens. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Good night, Dobranoc. Very much. Very, very nice comments in the chat box. But uh, if you would like to uh, contact me and share uh, your stories with me, because uh, I, I read some very moving stories from you. Uh, please don't uh, uh, don't hesitate to, to contact me. Uh, the, the, my email address is uh, in the chat box, so uh, please free, uh, feel free uh, to drop an email to me and share and tell us more of the stories because it's really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you again, Magda, for. Oh, oh. Christina, do you do you have a, a last yeah, minute question? Thumbs up, that's all. Oh right, okay. I, I'm so used to that. <laughs> yeah, bravo. That, that hand up rather than thumbs up. Um, Magda, did you have any last minute that just before we finish up? Did you have any last minute things to to say or do or? Uh, uh, no, not really. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me for giving this opportunity to spread the word of uh, um, our project and uh, Polish artists and uh, their stories and uh, as I said I'm a, uh, in the beginning I'm a journalist uh, so I'm really fascinated by this um, human stories uh, so uh, again if you would like to share tell me something more about uh, your background about your uh, parents or grandparents uh, don't afraid to, uh, to, to write to me the email address is in the chat box Thank you. Let's stay in touch. 
So thank you again, uh, Magda, for all the effort you've put into to putting together tonight's uh, talk and presentation. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, Shannon of the Pines, I'd just like uh, to let you know about the next Penciled In event in our calendar. Um, it's on the 8th of June, uh, and that is the a talk by uh, Professor Kowalski from uh, Jan Kornowski University in Kielce about the Scottish community in Poland uh, from the Middle Ages through to the early modern period. Um, so if you'd uh, like to attend that, we'd be delighted to see you there as well. There'll be more information about that coming up uh, on our website and our members will uh, hear about it through our email list as well. If you want to uh, learn more about the SPCA, you can find our website at uh, Scott Polls uh, and also on Facebook, again, Scott Polls. Um, and again, members are the first to find out about these sorts of events. Uh, so if you, you're interested in the work that we do, uh, do consider uh, membership to, to find out what we're up to. Other than that, uh, I'd like to wish all of you a very pleasant evening and a lovely rest of the week. And hope to see you at another SPCA event at some point in the next few months. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Bye, Leslie. Good night. Bye, Mike. <laughs>